Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying became the most high-profile victims of campus activism when they were chased out of Evergreen College by a student mob. It thrust them to national prominence. Since then, they're finding a new role as part of what's being called the intellectual dark web. Famously, you had the incident in Evergreen, which meant that you had to leave the campus, leave your, your post. But what's really striking is that you and Heather were teaching evolutionary biology. So a lot of the sort of the reality of the biological differences between men and women, a lot of these subjects that are now really hot topics in the culture within what a lot of people would recognize as one of the most progressive left wing colleges in the country. Are there lessons from that that, and also when, when you were forced to leave Evergreen, it wasn't the students that you've been teaching, it was students who you hadn't been teaching. So you're obviously doing something right in those, in over a decade of being there. What lessons, how did you do it? What lessons can we as a culture learn from that? Uh, there are tremendous lessons. And the key to what Heather and I were doing was that we started out by engineering a community that was safe to have discussions. And discussions that were we to take what was said in our classroom and to import it into a faculty meeting would have caused a conflagration for sure. But you have a group of students, they show up, many of them don't even really know why they're there. Heather and I were doing this for 15 years and a lot of our students came to us word of mouth. Somebody says, oh, you have to take this course in evolution. People who didn't realize they had any interest in the subject whatsoever would show up. And then you lure them in. It's a, a question of broadening their worldview so that they can understand that all of the things that they know they care about, all of the things that they find fun to do, all of the pursuits that drive them, their, their loves, their passions, that all of these things are products of evolution. And that means that understanding evolution provides a kind of roadmap against the inner confusion. That's a very powerful incentive for people to embrace it. So the answer to your question is you provide the safety to explore where people quickly get the idea that they are not going to be backed against the wall for saying something that sounds radical or off. We had covenants that actually gave people the right to speak and then retract what they said if it didn't sound right or if they changed their mind or if they came to, to see something about their position they hadn't known before, which meant that they had the protection of the community just by virtue of playing in good faith. So the cultivation of what, if the term wasn't so polluted, you'd have to call a safe space is the first, the, the first step in creating these difficult conversations. And then there's the incentive to have the conversation, which comes from the fact that you get something positive for it. You know, to understand yourself, to understand why people interact in the way they do is a very powerful advantage. And if you're presented with the question of would you like to endure some discomfort in order to have the power to understand your own life? Almost everybody will say yes. A lot of people are describing the intellectual dark web as a sort of placeholder for this is what a conversation looks like. That there's a lot of different perspectives within it, but what people agree on is this is what a genuine conversation in good faith looks like. And We've made that a bit of a focus on our channel, what we've called the meta conversation. What needs to exist for this meta conversation to take place? And what are the forces that are acting against it? The meta conversation requires a kind of safety. And the thing that the IDW has done is it has bootstrapped that kind of safety on topics where people experience in general a profound lack of safety. So I think the reason there has been such a uh, focus on the IDW is that people through the internet can watch others saying things, the very nuance of which would cause them to blow up if you said them, you know, in a speech on a university campus, let's say. And watching people have those discussions and respond to each other in spite of disagreement and not have catastrophe rain in on them 
is, uh, I think, heartening. In fact, I know that that's the reaction because I hear a lot from individuals who tell me what they see, and they are cheering for the, the simple demonstration that these conversations are still possible. On our channel, we've talked a lot about what we call the meta-conversation. And the intellectual dark web seems to be an attempt to sort of carve out a space to be able to have conversations about things that are very difficult to have, to talk about in the media. And I'm really interested as, as well, your background in Evergreen. Obviously, a lot of people know about what happened and you and Brett being forced to leave. But what sort of really struck me is that you both were teaching evolutionary biology there for over a decade without creating any of these reactions that we're seeing, talking about the reality of sex differences, talking about these subjects that often provoke a huge reaction when they're discussed in the media. So I'm really interested what that was like, how you did it, and whether there are any lessons that we can learn more generally about how to have these kind of conversations. A technique that both Brett and I used uh, was to open the first day by saying, don't trust me. Don't trust me on the basis of my credentials and my authority or the fact that, certainly that the fact that I have the power to assess you and perhaps affect your future as a result. Uh, I have to earn your trust, I have to earn your respect, and hopefully over time I will, and you can stop questioning every single thing that comes out of my mouth, but uh, to begin with, please do, please do question. That, that is actually going to be a sign of respect. Uh, and uh, we, both Brett and I, insisted on classrooms that were always respectful and that always understood that people disagreeing with ideas was quite different from proclaiming dislike of the human beings who were voicing those ideas. And so, you know, separating out those two things, the, the human the human, the whole human person and the thing that they are saying at the moment, um, even if it's some entrenched, firmly held belief, still those are two different things and disagreement does not, does, is not the same as dislike for the person. Um, when we taught together, this was particularly easy to demonstrate because as, as a married couple who were presumably not on the verge of divorce, which we, which we weren't, um, we could disagree with each other and we did. And you know, even though we were right in the middle of our own material, you know, we would disagree on topics of sexual selection, and uh, you know, evolution of parental care, and you know, under what conditions territoriality evolves, and these sorts of things that we were we were always teaching on, and students could observe how we disagreed, what that looked like, and also watch us come back in the next morning, clearly having you know <laughs> shared dinner in a bed the night before. So, um, this sort of model of intellectual disagreement, disagreement was particularly easy, frankly, to do um, when it was us together in a classroom. And I think students very quickly did feel seen, and I know that many of them did, and I hope that nearly all of them did feel um, to some degree understood. You know, we insisted on knowing all of their names very quickly. And you know, by the end of the first week of class, I would know everyone's names and at least something, something about their developmental history, which would allow me to start sort of, you know, building an architecture in my head of like, who is this person? It's still going to be a cartoon for quite a while, and you know, to some degree, we, it's all we carry around with us. You know, we have these caricatures that maybe turn into cartoons that maybe become more fleshed out, and maybe we get these photorealistic images in our heads of other human beings after we know them for decades, but it's never complete. And so to just start going down that road and to make it clear that you are going down that road with each one of the people in the classroom. And not because you think it's your job, but because you're actually very interested. It meant that um, we didn't, we were able to talk about difficult subjects pretty easily, right? We, and you know, in, in some ways it was what students were signing up for. Uh, you know, I did the, the two kinds of programs that I did most were Vertebrate evolution, which was not, did not veer too much into politically dangerous territory, but animal behavior is rife with it. You know, you can't, you, you can't not go there if you want to do it honestly. And so, talking about, um, and, and you know, and humans are animals, so we didn't, we didn't veer from humans. And in fact, all of the seminars that I tended to do in those programs were specifically on humans, on human evolution readings, uh, what our history has looked like, and mostly our prehistory. Um, 
and frankly students especially from historically marginalized and oppressed groups were particularly interested several several people told me nearly every year i taught this material that they were particularly interested to finally get a read on what it was that evolution had to say about about being gay or about different races or about especially you know in my case i would teach a lot on on sex and gender and you know on on what it was to be male versus female. And also to specifically be, be educated in how to assess bad logic, because that, that was the thing. You know, that's anyone who's teaching in 2018 or the 21st century in general and is teaching a litany of facts is not doing their students a service. Right? You can get that on Coursera or Wikipedia or any number of MOOCs. Or, you know, it's, just, it's, it's all available online. All the facts are there to be found. What you want to do in the classroom is develop a relationship so that you can call people out when they say things that contain within them a logical fallacy or don't allow you to, you know, you, if it's unfalsifiable, if you proclaim something that's unfalsifiable, you can watch as, you know, I, the faculty, or some other student are sort of caught up and go, well, I actually cannot respond to that. Here's why. That means that what you've just proposed to me is not a testable hypothesis. This, we can't do science on it. And if you want to take some other way of knowing and try to, try to do it with what you've said, okay. But if we are trying to figure out what is true, science is the best tool we've got, and we can't do science on the thing you've said. What can we do to what you've said to make it falsifiable? And then let's work as hard as we can to falsify it. And then if we can't, the longer we can't, the more likely it is that it is true, even though we'll never completely know that. And yeah, boy, is that freeing. It's so freeing, it's, an, it's actually educational, and students walk out going, okay, I, I am now freed to think for myself, whereas I felt sort of roped in by authority. And I think most educators, most people who are in educational roles do a better job of demonstrating their own authority than they do of actually freeing students from the yoke of that authority and learning to think for themselves. And what do you think are the principles for discussing these kind of topics that you could take from your experience at Evergreen and take out into the world? Certainly having some sort of a document in advance that everyone has agreed to is incredibly useful. You also need someone who's willing to and uh, enabled to enforce it. And in, in the modern authoritarian left landscape, enforcers are always seen as bad. You know, hierarchy is, is a sign of the patriarchy and all of this. Um, but you, you actually can't just have something like the Chicago Principles or what was called a covenant in an evergreen classroom, um, which established in advance what the responsibilities are between all the players, between faculty and students in both directions, and what, what do you do if you have a conflict, and you know, you know, all, of, all of the things that you should expect uh, in an honorable uh, community. Uh, and in the case of a classroom, as much as you know, it, was, it was easy to hand away the authority um, it, on an everyday basis and say, please question anything that I say that you don't agree with. But the fact is, it wasn't a complete handing away of authority because I was still faculty at the end of the day. And so it was still clearly my, you know, I was still going to be the arbiter of, <clears throat> of disputes that came up. So you need that. How do you scale that into a non-classroom situation where there is no clear, even an authority that wants to to cede their authority, you need someone who can step in and say, mm, you're, you're going against the rules. And you mentioned the covenant before. That, is that really important to basically ask people to buy into a set of principles before engaging in the conversation? Covenants were a feature of Evergreen from its founding. So the founders of the college decided that every class should begin with a covenant between professor and student in which the expectations were set out. Most of the covenants that I saw were uninteresting, but it was a place where if you chose to, you could do a lot of work. And the key utility is that by setting the expectations out as you come through the door, while you still have the right to say, ah, maybe this program isn't for me, that means that later on when you invoke this covenant and say, well, you agreed to this set of rules, why are you now saying something else? People, people recognize that, that the obligations they've signed up for are, are important. 
And I will say, one of the things that I started adding to my covenants late in my teaching at Evergreen was that this is not an end-user license agreement. End-user license agreements are designed so you won't read them, so you won't understand what your rights and obligations are. The covenant was the opposite of that. It was imperative that you read it so that you understood why you were being expected to do X, Y, and Z along the way. And by and large, uh, it worked quite well. We spent time on these things on the first day of class, so people, so people got it. And then having signed up for it, in my experience and Heather's experience, people pretty well lived by it. And we had communities of good faith interactants that uh, functioned beautifully most of the time. And how do we take those lessons out and apply those in the world more generally? I mean, the intellectual dark web is one attempt at creating this kind of safe space, for want of a better word. But are there other ways that we can do it? Well, the problem is you will immediately, not having such a covenant, you will immediately trip over the following problem if you attempt it. The covenant is exclusionary. What you are really saying when you set out uh, an agreement about how we will talk and disagree and challenge each other is you are saying that if you don't agree to these rules, you're not welcome here. Now, nobody likes to hear you're not welcome here, and at the moment that sets people off. It's a, they have a hair trigger for being told, somebody's not welcome there, who are you to say who's welcome? And the point is, well, no, I'm not telling you you're not welcome. I'm telling you anyone who doesn't agree to this set of good faith principles isn't welcome. And as soon as you do agree, then you are. So you're the one deciding whether you're welcome or not. Having decided to live by these rules, then you get the benefits of what is in effect a much more capable but more fragile conversation. And this is, I think, one of the hardest lessons uh, of the hardest lessons for me at least of complex systems, is that very often the most capable creatures or mechanisms are also the ones with the narrowest requirements. So that a beautifully architected creature may have very precise limits on what it can tolerate. The beautiful conversation that is capable of traversing some new landscape and doing it deftly, that conversation does not happen when anybody can lob any accusation at any moment with no evidence. It happens when people are protected enough to try out difficult things and then to adjust their position and learn where they've arrived. So the upshot, you have to be able to exclude in order to do the extraordinary. Doesn't mean that you're excluding people for arbitrary reasons. You're excluding them for very simple reasons, which is that their presence will destroy the attempt. So. Um, I think we have to figure out how to intelligently exclude in the interest of accomplishing something for which there is obviously a great hunger, and that great hunger implies that there is a deficit. And if you were to distill down what, say, three or four principles of having a generative conversation in good faith are, what would they be? What conditions allow for that? So how do you know you're having one, maybe? Like, what are, what are, the, what are the signals that you're actually doing it right, <laughs> that, that you're actually having a good conversation? No rote apologies. Apologies for actual wrongs, but no rote apologies. Do not apologize for things that you did not actually do. And if you see sort of a, a, a culture of rote apology in a big conversation, there's probably fear right underneath the surface. Similarly, I would say look for laughter, look for humor, look, look for, and not just, you know, there's a, everyone can tell the difference between nervous laughter and, um, and regular from the gut laughter in which things, even when you didn't see something coming, or maybe that's often when things get funny, um, when a conversation that was very serious or very technical suddenly erupts in laughter, if that can happen, there's probably not fear right beneath the surface and, uh, and obviously laughter is also a way that people, people bond. Um, if, you know, this doesn't happen in every conversation that is, that is far reaching and good faith, but obviously if you see people changing their minds or people challenging one another and coming away with any evidence of changed perspective, 
uh, that's but that and that's sort of just too obvious. Um, I guess I, I guess those first two that I came up with are maybe maybe two that I remember most fondly from the class from from both you know these three hour meandering interactive lectures or labs or even more often you know long meals on field trips where students cooked uh, and then we all ate together and then we might sit around the table for hours afterwards or go and sit around a campfire and um, having such conversations that ranged from you know, deeply theoretical science to the state of the world to individual stories from people's childhoods about their siblings or their animals or the adventures they've been on uh, interspersed with, I mean this is always helpful too, someone breaks out a guitar and you know just just like laughing together singing together is a, is a way to bring people together so these are some of the things that can't happen online which is part of I think why we find such an impoverished and quick to anger set of conversations online that we're missing the just like the actual visceral being in each other's presence and um, that very quickly allows us to let our guard down. You, you mentioned this sort of sense of fear under the surface, yeah. which I think a lot of people would say is very present at the moment in a lot of conversations. Did you feel that fear in Evergreen until things erupted? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yes. Um, because Brett and I are married and we're faculty there together and we're watching the whole thing unfold, we didn't feel fear, we, like we weren't afraid, um, but there was a definite culture of fear in which people were not speaking what they knew to be true. And uh, Brett heard this much more than I did because he was more public with his uh, disagreements with what the administration was doing. But after every time that he would stand up in a faculty meeting or send an email to the faculty and staff email list, he would have several, sometimes very many, faculty and staff come to him privately on private channels, either in person or over email, and say, thank you, I can't say it because. That's a culture of fear. And in fact, he claimed this, he said this, six months or so before the Evergreen protests uh, became public and went viral, and the response, uh, he said this, I think, over email, and, and the response from some of the faculty who were leading the charge, who were leading the authoritarian leftist charge, was, there's no culture of fear, prove it. Who has come to you? Well, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who has come to me, because that's exactly how this, this would work. And, um, so, you know, people will continue to come to me only, you know, only if I protect them and you know I think one thing that I won't speak for Brett here but one thing that I think I wish that I had done differently was ask people who were coming to us privately to speak up. I did on a couple of occasions and there were a lot of reasons not to and I, under I understand them but this could have had an, a totally different ending and Furthermore, it could have modeled for every place else that this is happening, which is to say, just about every American campus, a lot of workplaces, and boy, have we heard stories. You know, it would, it, the, the college campus ones are easy to report on because they tend to be in these public places with, you know, poor young indoctrinated students apparently making asses of themselves, but it's, that's not the real story. You know, it's, I, I really don't think that they're, they are the ones who are driving this. And what we have you think it's the professors driving it yeah yeah it's it's the professors it's the professors and increasingly the administrators and that's not to say that students don't have agency but very little of these modern protests looks like protest the likes of which i remember that i participated in it feels uh very much more about orthodoxy and about falling into line and about reading from a script and the fact that i have now seen not just at evergreen but at two different conferences and a couple of other places as well um, these attempted power grabs in some places successful like at evergreen and in some places not in which uh, the the authoritarian power grabbers 
start using all the same words. It's, it's all on the same script. So it's, it's not that there is some central clearinghouse where it's coming out of, but, um, but it comes from some traditions within, unfortunately, within the humanities. Uh, increasingly being taught at schools of education and therefore spreading very quickly into the K-12 system, primary and secondary school, and thus, frankly, indoctrinating whole, whole hosts of children who are now coming of age and don't have the tools with which to question what it is that they're being told. So I would say increasingly it will become a problem that the, the young people themselves are perpetrating on the world. But at least until very recently, it was being driven by the faculty. It was, driven, it was being driven by the people who were supposedly the adults, who were supposed to know better and who didn't. And that's why I would say, I wish that I had had the foresight to ask anyone who came to Brett Army privately, you know, maybe not to push it, but to ask, will you please say this publicly? And for the most part, I didn't. For the most part, I said, thank you, it's good to know we're not alone. Yeah. And that's true. It's, it's very good to know you're not alone when you're facing some you know, really stupid and horrifying stuff, but it's not enough. Ultimately, what you need is actually not that high a percentage of people to stand up and say, I see this and the emperor has no clothes. You know, like that, that's, that's what it is. You're waiting for that moment. And one or two or three people isn't enough in a group that, that's, that is that big. Um, when, the, when the authoritarians on the left are shrieking in language that sounds sort of very superficially like it's anti-racist and anti-sexist and anti-homophobic and all of this, and that's what they say they're doing. And some of them in the movement actually, I think, really do 100% believe that that is what they're doing. But in effect, they are having exactly the opposite. Um, they are having exactly the opposite effect. What do you think those, the minimum rules are that you would have to sign up to, to, to have a generative conversation? Well, I know something about what the rules are having played around with different covenants with different classes at Evergreen. But I would also say the most interesting thing about the IDW phenomenon is that we don't have a written set of rules. What happened is people who separately had arrived at some sort of uh, kit for doing this kind of work found each other because the world had become a place in which conversation had become impossible. So if conversation is impossible because saying things that should be sayable causes a blowout, and then you run into people where you can say those things and no blowout occurs, it's natural for you to gravitate. So the most fascinating thing to me is that this brought people from so far afield, from such different backgrounds of such different political perspective and effectively what unites that to the extent that the IDW is a group, what unites that group is the discovery of the toolkit for um, participating in incredibly uh, difficult discussions. And if you were to name those principles, what do you think they are? Well, once you have established that your community in which you're having a discussion is a good faith community in which essentially every person has agreed with the idea that they would rather lose if they have an incorrect argument than win. In other words, if your priority is getting to what is true and that priority uh, supersedes your own rise, then you can do a great deal. And um, what happens at that limit is you can assume that the other people in the conversation are making a kind of sense. And to the extent that they sound like they are not making a kind of sense, you know where to look. You do not resort to the accusation. You are being absurd. You say, I wonder why it is that when I hear through my ears what you have just said does not add up in the slightest. So let me try out what I hear you saying, and you tell me where I don't have it. So that's the steel manning aspect, which is really a, a formalization that has caught on of some instinctive process where in order to reach some new place with somebody, you have to understand what they're saying 
um, not just enough to counter it, but you have to understand it well enough to know what really might actually be wrong with it, which means you have to also know what's right with it. So it is the, I mean, I think overarchingly, it is the question of what role argument plays. If argument is a tool to accomplish political ends, you can't have these conversations. If argument is a tool to discover what's true, from which might flow a political desire, but it is not the motivating force, then um, you will act very differently as you argue. You will, act, you will argue from uh, a perspective of good faith, and you will, if you're in a position to expect good faith from whoever you're arguing with, you have the potential of both arriving at some place better than you started out. You might both learn, and that's, you know, it's win-win. Mm. And now the image of Evergreen is very poor after what's happened. What, but I know that you've spoken before about that there was a lot of really good stuff going on there, a lot of really uh, inspiring stuff. What are the other things that you would like to see as the positive aspects of, of Evergreen's teaching style that you think we can all learn from? Well, I've thought a lot about this because it seems to me that Evergreen's model was half brilliant and half crazy. And there was no reason that you couldn't take the crazy part and eliminate it and uh, have improved the model. But there was something about treating the founding structure as sacred that prevented the population of Evergreen from repairing itself, which resulted in it blowing up. The key factors that worked were an unparalleled level of pedagogical freedom. So professors really had carte blanche to teach what they wanted, how they wanted, and that meant that people who wished to discover what was possible could, uh, could explore. And that was coupled with a... <coughs> That was coupled with a classroom structure in which students took one class full-time and professors taught one class full-time and those classes could go on for two or three quarters in some cases. What that meant was that you had a tremendous amount of high quality contact with your students. So if you were dedicated to the job of teaching in some new way, you knew exactly who you were teaching, just at the level of every individual in the room was known to you. That meant you could track the blind spot that a student had and you could work. You could tailor what you were saying and you could try to make sure that it landed on a particular mind in a particular way that would cause some epiphany that needed to happen. I don't know of another model in which that's possible. That requires the freedom and the uh, high intensity of contact between professors and students. And if I was architecting a college in the aftermath of the experience of teaching at Evergreen, I would preserve those things uh, above all others. What I would do away with is the mechanism for hiring professors and recruiting students. Both of those mechanisms were badly broken and they meant that the population that arrived at Evergreen was not the right population to take advantage of those structures. It was a haphazard mix. So the main problem with the hiring was that it was done by grouping faculty together and asking them what positions we thought we should hire, rather than looking at whose classes were full and saying, well, if psychology is always full, we need some more psychology professors. Now, I'm not an absolutist in this regard. I wouldn't say that whatever the population coming to the college wants, we should hire as many people as, as it can handle. But I do think within limits, you need a feedback mechanism that tells you what is succeeding, which classes are resulting in students walking away feeling like, whoa, that was definitely worth my time and my tuition money, rather than walking away saying, what the hell was that and why did I spend 10 weeks on it? So had there been a feedback mechanism that caused that which worked to be propagated, Evergreen would have been a much more effective place. Evergreen also had an almost complete disconnect between the uh, admissions office and the recruiters and the faculty. So we often, as faculty, had no idea how the college was being advertised and to whom. And really, 
Evergreen was largely advertised as a pretty liberal arts college on the Puget Sound, when that was the last reason you should go there. It was really the place to go if you had very high potential, but you needed somebody to treat you as an individual because you weren't perhaps well built for school or you were capable of something extraordinary that was going to require uh, somebody to pay particular attention to your, your skills. Those were reasons to go, but they weren't anywhere in the recruiting materials. So what we got was a haphazard collection of students. Now, Heather and I did very well in this environment because our programs were always oversubscribed. And so in a sense, although only rarely were we in a position to have an application for a program that would allow us to choose the best students for it. Um, we were in a position to discourage people who would not benefit from our programs and encourage people who would benefit. And when you get a room full of people that are more or less there because either they think they need to hear what you're saying or you think they might benefit from it, there's a tremendous amount of potential. And. Evergreen now has a pretty toxic reputation, it's fair to say. And but what are the what are the good parts of the Evergreen model that you think we can learn from, we should learn from? We had time, we had academic freedom. And with those two things and good faith and you know, like I said, a classroom effectively has either a benevolent or a non-benevolent dictator. There is an authority figure no matter how much of the authority they want to turn away. So uh, in, in my case, I think I was always a benevolent dictator, uh, basically enforcing rules of decency such that we had, we never prioritized justice over truth, but we got both because we did so, because we investigated what was true with a sense of, of care and compassion. And most colleges and universities just don't afford the time. So study abroad trips where students will go uh, for a, a month or two could, but for the most part those are these one-off things where the students aren't even from the same university until they show up somewhere far flung and then they're mostly, you know, if they're in cities, they're in someone's dorms and it's, it's, it just doesn't really create community the same way. Uh, so uh, really being able to dive deep with people and reveal truths about yourself, not just what you think and how you think, but also just about who you are as a person, such that everyone in the community is a little bit exposed. And once everyone's a little bit exposed, and you can see, okay, we have all trusted each other a little bit here. And we are all therefore assuming that there is safety in that I can afford to take intellectual risks, and I'm not going to be attacked for doing so. And that's, that's what we were able to do uh, year after year after year. Uh, so Brett said it before, but you know, I was on sabbatical when the protests happened at Evergreen and not a single one of the students who showed up to protest against him did he or I know. You know, this, this wasn't our students who turned against us. That didn't happen. Uh, if that had happened, that would be a totally different story. And you know, I would I would hope that you would be pushing back on my story of you know how effective this was, right? Like if if we had legions of students or any even you know a couple, you know, find out what their story is, find out actually what it is that they're saying that disagrees with what what Brett and I claim about what we were doing for 15 years on campus was. Um, and I'm sure, I know for sure that given that the college that we loved hired a PR firm to basically demonize Brett and then us that they, if they could have found such students, they, they would have, and we'd be hearing from them, but they, they haven't. So um, the, fact, the fact is that people become loyal when they are treated well. And if you're only treating people well in order to create loyalty, that's not actually being treated well. And smart young people can see that. And so, actually, actually, I mean, smart, everyone can see that, but I think you're even more able to see that when you're, when you're young and fresh and um, you've just been, no matter how good your school experience was, you, everyone has had some just awful teachers who clearly disrespected them as individuals, didn't really believe in their humanity, didn't really think much of them, kind of just hoping to be done with it so they could, you know, retire whenever they were retiring or go drink that night or whatever it was. And at the point that students show up in a classroom 
and the faculty says, I know you've had awful educational experiences, even if, even if you're an awesome student and you've had mostly excellent educational experiences. I know that you've probably been, uh, been taught with a combination of fear and authority and pointless work, and I hope to do none of those things, and I encourage you to call me out if you think that's what I'm doing. That was possible. That was, that's possible with time in a way it's not in a, we meet for an hour twice a week kind of class.